let's move on from water to um, the refrigeration. So, so time, okay, okay. Um, refrigeration, of course, is extremely important, right? Because again, uh, two reasons. If you don't have electric access to electricity, how do you keep foods, uh, preserve foods, medicines, things like that? We all know the COVID vaccine has to be refrigerated at some insane temperature, at least the Pfizer one. It's really, really difficult if you, do, if you have to do this in the developing world, right? Which is why the Johnson & Johnson was preferred in that case, or the AstraZeneca, because of the lower, uh, higher temperature. These are very fundamental problems. Same problem happens for disaster relief, right? You have a hurricane and there's no electricity, no infrastructure. How do you come in and provide foods or, or, or medicines or you know, things like that? Can we make ice? So, but in order to do this, you need to come back to understand the heat engine principle. How does a re simple refrigerator work? And I'm gonna play a, a, a simple video here and I'm gonna mute this. This is a nice video. What's going on in the refrigerator? And I'm basically showing you some tubing metal tubing, aluminum tubing, some kind of metal tubing, and a couple of devices, a compressor and an expansion valve. Let's just see how this thing works. So the working fluid is sometimes a gas, and I've designated that by red. Sorry. So this is talking about a conventional refrigerator. And when, when, when you watch the video, Tony, if you want you to think about the two things, there's a hot end and a cold end. And there's some work being done in between. And that work is what's creating the cooling happening inside the refrigerator. This is the abstraction I want you to get out of it, not necessarily I don't understand the, the details of the refrigeration. So, okay. Let's... Picture of what's going on in the refrigerator. And I'm basically showing you some tubing, metal tubing, aluminum tubing, some kind of metal tubing, and a couple of devices, a compressor and an expansion valve. Let's just see how this thing works. So the working fluid is sometimes a gas, and I've designated that by red, and sometimes a liquid, and I've designated that by blue. So what happens? Well, there's a compressor. The compressor is a pump that pressurizes the working fluid and pumps it around in this loop. And so when the compressor gets a hold of the working fluid, it compresses it, um, and it becomes a high pressure gas. And then that fluid moves through some coils, sometimes in the bottom of the refrigerator, which is actually a rather poor place for it, energy efficiency wise, better places on top. And you might have seen ancient refrigerators that actually have a little round thing on top. And that was a better place to put these coils, sometimes in the back, sometimes they're in the bottom. But the purpose of those coils is to take that high pressure gas and let it get rid of some of its energy in the process condensing to a liquid. So as it goes through those coils, it gets rid of some of its energy. It rejects that energy to the outside environment, the room the refrigerator is in. Uh, translation, if you touch the coils of the refrigerator, either underneath or in back, they're warm. They're giving heat out to the room that the refrigerator is in. A refrigerator, ironically, gives off heat. Well, not so ironically. We'll see why in a minute. Okay, so now we have the working fluid in liquid form, but it's still at high pressure. It's rejected this heat to the surrounding environment. Then it moves through the expansion valve and the high pressure liquid going through this valve, which is basically just a tiny hole in the a tiny little orifice where the gas is forced to go through. And as it goes through, it expands and cools and becomes a low pressure liquid. So now we have low pressure liquid and the low pressure liquid is then circulated through a series of coils that are insulated from the outside environment, but they're in contact with the innards of the refrigerator and heat flows. Again, that's the right term because heat is, is energy flowing because of a temperature difference. Heat flows into these cool coils and it evaporates the liquid and it takes energy to evaporate the liquid. And that energy is ultimately extracted from the materials inside the refrigerator. It goes into the working fluid. It's pumped around. The heat has been extracted from the contents of the refrigerator. And now the working fluid is a gas because it's evaporated at the expense of the energy of the things inside the refrigerator. And it goes back to the compressor and the cycle starts over again. The net effect of the refrigerator is simply to pump heat from inside the refrigerator, from the contents to the, to the outside. Right? Okay. Back to this.
So, so hopefully that made sense. Uh, you had a, I'm gonna go back a second here. Oops. Uh, I just wanna highlight a couple of things. And close this. So here you had a hot, hot part of the system. And there you had a cold part of the system. Here you have to put some energy in, to compress the liquid into a gas, to increase the pressure. Actually, that's still gas. This increase in the pressure of the gas. Here, you don't have to put energy. You're just allowing the gas to skip. This is working against the second law of thermodynamics. So you have to put in energy. This is just letting the second law of thermodynamics do its work. You don't have to do anything. Just put a little hole, let it expand. Okay, two opposing things, right? Hot part, cold part. So this transition between these two is what's allowing you to essentially do some work to extract heat from inside the refrigerator and pump it out. Okay, now if, if you abstract it this way, you can think of lots and lots of ways to do this with solar, right? I can put in a solar collector and heat one side or use a photovoltaic device and run a compressor, right? Or I could heat something, run a turbine, and then run a compressor. There are all kinds of clever things. So let's look at a few examples. Oops. So solar electric refrigeration is exactly what I just said. You have a solar panel, uh, energy comes in. And in the case of the, uh, the solar panel, the, the power is simply current produced by the panel times its voltage, which we will see. So don't worry too much about it. You're not familiar with it. But for those of you who are electrical engineers, you can appreciate that as the input to the system, right? And then that runs a DC motor here. And remember the efficiency of the motor that we talked about, we need a control system to maintain that speed. And that runs a compressor, which does what we just saw, talked about before. The rest of the system is exactly the same as what we saw in the video. So we don't talk about it. So challenges, of course, uh, direct connection, whether it has to be portable, whether you need a battery, you need a variable capacity compressor, because like I said, the sunlight varies over time during the day, and it's really hard to maintain that. Efficiencies can be relatively good, they're like 30% or so, but it can be expensive. But this is a problem that is waiting for some creative people like you to solve, refrigeration. I know some of you express interest in it, so I'm very excited to see what you guys uh, think about. To be complete, you should also, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna say much more about this. To be complete, you should also be aware of uh, something called thermoelectric cooling. Now, before we explain what this is, thermoelectric cooling is very, very expensive, not so efficient, but it has one very important thing going for it. It has no moving parts. It's completely solid state. So when you send a probe to Mars, like the Mars rover, the temperature on Mars during daylight day can be extremely high, like 400 degrees Fahrenheit. At night, it's very, very cold, so huge extremes. So you need to cool it somehow, cool your electronics. I mean, or, you know, recently they had a helicopter, right? Travel in Mars, some of these thought. You have to run, run the motors and so on. You cannot, it has to survive. So you have to cool things. So in that case, they, have, they use something like this. They don't care about the cost so much. They don't want anything that will fail. This is an example of an application. What is this? This is an idea called the Peltier, Peltier effect. Peltier is the name of the person who discovered this and won the Nobel Prize about more than 100 years ago. The idea is relatively simple. It's a semiconductor device. There are some materials like uh, this telluride that you can see here. That they are semiconductors. For those of you who have taken 3200, you probably know what these things are. They have electrons and holes. They have band gap. So the idea is that you apply a voltage, a DC power source, and the electrons flow from one side to the other side. As the electrons flow, they carry kinetic energy, which is nothing other than heat. Okay, kinetic energy is the manifestation, the manifestation of heat is kinetic energy of the molecules. 
So that's what it happens. It's taking absorbing heat from one side and taking it into the other side. And if you have, that's the N type bismuth tellurite, which is excessive electrons, you can all, you have to have the other side, you have to have a P type bismuth tellurite, which is an excess of holes or absence of electrons. It's okay if you don't know it, it's not terribly important from the perspective of solar, but something you should be aware of. Okay. Uh, they're very small and portable, relatively low efficiency, and they're extremely expensive because of the materials. And there are other approaches as well, things like uh, more, how do I say it, more um, exotic approaches, like thermoacoustic cooling, magnetic cooling, and something that actually uh, related to optics, I should, I should also mention briefly, is uh, laser-based cooling. So, about three or four years ago, the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for laser trapping of particles. You might have heard about this. And this idea is basically when, when light hits something, like the light from the projector hits my hand, it is imparting momentum on my hand as it bounces off. And of course, we don't feel it because photons have no mass. The momentum is extremely low. Right? You, don't, you don't feel it. But if you have a very light material like atoms and so on, you can actually feel it. You get a recoil from the, from the reflection of the light or absorption of the light. You can utilize the recoil to essentially slow down the motion of these molecules. Kind of like a, like a, a swing. If you have a person on a swing, you push the wrong way, you can reduce the amplitude. You push the right way, you can increase the amplitude, right? You push the wrong. Here you're trying to reduce the amplitude, slow it down, to cool it down. That's how people get to quantum mechanically uh, low temperatures, like almost zero Kelvin and so on. That was the purpose of, but that's another way of laser cool. We want to talk about it. It has very other, very important implications as well, but um, not, it's, it's important in my research, but not, not terribly important for the purposes of this class. Uh, you can also do solar thermal refrigeration, so not necessarily going through electricity, just creating heat directly from sunlight with an absorber, and then using that as a hot part of the system to do work in a refrigerator. I won't go through the details because there's lots of, uh, lots of details here, but I wanna spend a little bit of time at the end so uh, to brainstorm your ideas as well. So I'm not gonna go through the details, not terribly important for the purposes of this class, uh, but just be aware of them and feel free to look at it. And if you are working in this field, definitely do a literature search and then come talk to me as well. But very briefly, you can use those, uh, um, the, the plate collectors we talked about before. Um, there are many versions of these are two shown on the top left there. Let's not worry too much about the details there, but the idea is that you're using the heat as the input to the engine. And then the engine is then used for cooling, which can simply be the compressor, uh, running a compressor. Um, Things to be aware of is that when you try to collect heat with the collector, when the temperature of the collector goes up, it's also re-radiating the energy out. Its radiation efficiency also goes up with temperature. So we have, there's, a, there's an optimum temperature you wanna use these things at. Um, we'll come back to this because it's relevant to solar cells later on. Um, so, so cooling engine uh, efficiencies, we'll talk about it when we talk about the thermodynamics, works better at higher temperature differences, but you also get low, higher losses. So something to be aware of. But, but I'm gonna skip this part. We'll come back to it if we want, if, if those of you are interested. And the purpose of this class is not terribly important. I wanna use the last uh, 10 minutes or so to talk about uh, ideas and maybe have a brainstorm with you and ha have you also give, give, uh, discuss um, let me turn on the light first. Um, I, put, I, I threw out a couple of ideas here um, and I can show you some videos of what students did in the past to, to spark uh, some ideas. But um, so few things, daylighting. We don't have enough time to go through all this. That's why I just listed them. But daylighting is basically, right now we're using electricity uh, coal to generate the light inside. When I just turned that on, there was a big spike of electricity power generation, uh, power consumption, as you say. But could, could we, I mean, if you open the door, of course we have nice sunlight outside, could we somehow pipe that in and illuminate this room, right? That's a very nice challenge, important challenge and very lucrative opportunity. 
3M has an entire division doing exactly this. I can attest to it because I visited them. I saw their, 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 their huge business, multi-billion dollars selling daylight redirection films. Uh, many other companies do it as well. So I know someone mentioned uh, interesting, interest in this idea. So that's one option. Solid state lighting. So of course, we are all familiar with the fact that incandescent lamps, which this one is, is not as efficient as fluorescent lamps, which this one is, which are not as efficient as LEDs as in your backlights and your phones and your laptops and so on. Yeah, your laptop doesn't use these because they're very inefficient. Like you don't want the, the battery of your laptop to die. And we'll actually talk about uh, displays, LCD displays towards the end of this class because there's a very important energy relation to it. Come to that later on, uh, which is actually, I put it down, ultra efficient display. So if you can have some kind of innovation that improves the efficiency of portable phone displays, right? because electronics consumes a lot of power, but it's also a great opportunity because you can then make the marketing claim that your battery can last longer, right? So you can see everything is kind of tied together. Of course, optics for photovoltaics are obvious. So come up with very clever ideas for collecting light, bifacial solar cells we talked about last time, clever ways to collect the light, clever ways to trap the light, um, uh, Ways to condition the light such that the solar cell is more efficient. We'll talk more about that later on, which is called spectrum splitting. Um, you can also think about optics for solar fuel generation. A very, very simple example of this is hydroponic farms, which utilize LEDs with specific colors to ensure that crop yield is higher. This is, of course, a huge industry, particularly with the, with the legalization of marijuana, which is very, it's a huge industry now. So again, huge uh, applications of optics there. Of course, you can also think of hybrid systems. These are uh, large scale systems where you use heat, for instance, to heat a home, but a portion of that heat is also used to generate electricity. So it's a hybrid system. Let me give you an example. Uh, solar cells, you put on the roof of your house, um, they generate electricity, yeah? But they get hot, right? If you've ever seen one, you could touch it, it can get hot. And as silicon solar cells get hot, their efficiency drops. And we'll talk more about it later on to understand why. But if there was a way to cool the solar cells, you can keep its performance very good and it won't degrade as much. And one way to cool the solar cell is to run a pipe of water underneath, right? Coils of water. And the water will draw the heat away from the solar cell. Now, what are you doing? You have a hybrid system. Now you created hot water, which you can now use for cooking or you know, bathing or whatever. At the same time, you're also generating electricity. That's what's referred to as a hybrid. This is also very common in uh, Scandinavian countries, actually. Uh, so the last uh, few minutes, I wanna open the floor. And I know some of you mentioned interest. And this is your opportunity to maybe convince your teammates, because I'm going to assign teams, that your ideas are uh, exciting, worth working for. Um, or if you have some other thoughts, you know, I just want to keep a few minutes open. Um, and, and also, I should also open it up to whoever is online. Feel free. Uh, if you want to talk, I can unmute uh, and, and you're welcome to uh, talk to the entire class as well. Now, one thing I should mention is that when I form the teams, I'm going to unfortunately have to segregate it in the sense that the online students will be among themselves just because I don't expect them to meet in person. Although I don't expect you to meet in person either. So it doesn't really matter, but I'm gonna keep them separate just so you know, just because of the grading and so on. Um, any questions so far? Okay, so this is what I'm going to do is I'm gonna to try to do it this weekend. I need to assign the team so we have enough time to do the first uh, presentation. I'm gonna to try to essentially go through the Excel sheet of the students in uh, different sections. And I wanna look at whoever suggests, made suggestions and I'll try to match them. I may not be successful, but I'm gonna also, if, those, if you haven't mentioned anything, then I'll just allocate you based on what I think is interesting. So you have until the end of the day today, maybe tomorrow if you really come, if you want to. Um, anyone want to talk about your project? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, that's not a problem. I don't see that as a problem. I think it's a good thing. I see that as you will come up with many different solutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a problem at all. Yeah. Anyone want to chime in on any? Uh, no, you mentioned daylighting. Um, I like daylighting, so I'll probably, hopefully, assign some people. But um, anyone else? Uh, some of you mentioned desalination. I don't know your name, so. Chauncey, OK. You didn't send me a note. OK, good. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. I'm not really good with uh, names, but I'll remember faces. But um, yeah, send me the first assignment by end of day today. Really, no, no, nothing else that you're excited about? How about solar on a car? Or some, some clever stuff? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. That requires, uh, one second, uh, to generate hydrogen. I'm not a chemist, but uh, you know, let me think. How do they do it? Do they split water with electro electrolysis, do you know? Yeah, so I'm assuming you pass a current through water and you need a, cat a catalyst to, to split hydrogen and oxygen. I'm pretty sure that's how they do it. Now, of course, to pass the current, you can use solar, yeah. I'm not familiar with it as much, but definitely, I mean, I, I certainly pick something I'm not familiar with because then I can get, I get to learn. So send me a note if you're interested in working on it, certainly important. Something Hi, in chat? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I messaged you on Slack Someone's... for the project names. Is it fine? Yes, perfect. Yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other ideas, then I have one idea I want to talk about, but go ahead. Oh, yeah, crazy ideas are the best because I have one coming up. Yeah, okay, let's, let's uh, unpack it. That's a good point. What you're saying is similar to what you're saying. So you have an enclosure where you're starting to pump out the air, which has salt water. Now, what will happen as you reduce the, the, the pressure inside? What happens is that the vapor pressure decreases. Now, what does that mean? If, if you, what happens if you take a glass of water and go into space? Yes, it sublimes. It'll, it'll disappear immediately, right? Now, I'm not talking in the spaceship, but there's no gravity, it becomes water. But if you take it out actually into a vacuum, it'll it immediately disappear and leave the salt. What does that mean? That means as you pump the, the container down, you're reducing the, uh, the boiling point. So it'll start boiling at a lower temperature. So it's a good idea, yeah. So you can distill it, but what happens is, uh, and it's, both things happen. What you're saying is it'll reduce the solubility. So the water will essentially saturate out of the system. It becomes a crystal, right? How you go cr crystals and stuff. And the water that remains is pure, but it'll actually be, uh, become vapor. It's a good idea, yeah. It, the, you have to cool it, yeah. It depends, on the, it depends on the vacuum, but it's a good idea, yeah. I think there was a team couple of years ago who tried to do it with gravity. So you can imagine a big, big tube where you put salt water at the very top, but you have to somehow pump it up. And then you use the gravity to essentially push itself down through a filter. Now you can imagine what happens is you're creating a vacuum up there as it goes down, because there's no air, right? Uh, there is some uh, dissolved air, so it's not perfect vacuum, but yeah. That's a good, good idea. So you have to explore it a little bit. Yeah? Uh, yes. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head. This is the biggest Ach Achilles heel in this industry, in my opinion. 
Yeah, one of the biggest, yeah. Yes, that's related to my next slide. I'll come to that in a second. Did you want to complete your thought, Chancellor? So do you have a night? Yeah, so that's a great, great observation because an important problem waiting to be solved. And, you, and as you know, uh, Tesla's working on it with their with the battery and the way they're trying to solve it is basically by uh, amortizing the cost. They built a, they built a huge uh, battery manufacturing plant in Nevada and they're simply driving up the volume to reduce the cost. Because the biggest, biggest problem is the, the, the batteries are very expensive, but not a very elegant solution in my opinion, but it's one way to do it. Um, one of the uh, suggestions from chat was, um, coming up with ways to reduce light pollution for astronomy. Uh, I, I think it's a great idea. It's something to think about. It's a difficult problem to solve. I don't know how to solve it actually. So <laughs> I think there are people trying to design street lighting such that you minimize light pollution. And I've seen some designs like this and we will talk a little bit about the lighting later on. But in the interest of time, because there's another class, I should I want to throw my crazy idea out, which I was thinking about a couple of years ago with some students, because of um, because we have problem with uh, air quality. I want to close this for a second. I'll, I'll finish it quickly. So the idea was to build a uh, have a a hat that blows a clean column of air over where you're breathing, and the idea was to come up with you know, a very, very lightweight, small fan, some filters, cleans the air as it goes through, and you have a column of air which you can breathe. Maybe you can do it uh, 